So we do have a few more people. We are reading chapter 2 verse 55, 56 and 57. So the verses say, The blessed Lord said, When one entirely abandons all the desires that come into the mind, O son of Pritha, satisfied within the self, by the self, then he is called a person of stable wisdom. One whose mind is not agitated in sorrows, who has no attraction towards pleasures, he from whom attraction, fear and anger have disappeared, such a meditator <coughs> is called a person of stable wisdom. He who has no attachment directed towards anything or upon attaining anything good or bad, he neither greets it nor hates it. His wisdom is established. So what is Sri Krishna describing? In the verses before, in verse 54, Arjun asked, how does such a person look? And we said it's not really possible to tell from appearances. Many young students, seekers imagine that by looking at the person, they can tell how a teacher should be. Should be old, wear a nice costume, preferably have many, many followers, and such ideas. But these ideas are immature. Sri Krishna describes such a person. And this is not an external description, but a description of how he would be. And this is a person who abandons all desires when he is established in the self. A person of stable wisdom, sthith prajna, sthith prajna is stable wisdom. Until you are completely established in the self, there is a chance that one can fall from this state. That one who is established in the self has become a witness, is one of stable wisdom. And this person would not be agitated by sorrows nor attracted to pleasures. He has no fears, anger has disappeared. What does this mean? It doesn't mean that it may not be there in the mind field, in the chitta, but he is a witness, he is observing. And he's established in the self. So he does not experience attachment and aversion. This is describing a witness, a sakshi, describing that experience of sakshi bhava. Okay. Would anybody like to ask anything to this? Or can I proceed? Okay, so I'll just continue to the next verse, which is verse 58. This is a well-known verse. Some of you may recognize it. When like a tortoise withdrawing his limbs, one withdraws each and all of the senses from their objects, his wisdom is established. So Sri Krishna elaborates now on the process how it comes about to be that one becomes a witness. So he says that the mind withdraws from the objects of the world. The senses withdraw like a tortoise withdraws 
his limbs. And it's our nature. The mind in its natural state, when it is not pulled outward, it is very contemplative. So if we are able to withdraw inward, then we will immediately attain some contemplative states. But how can we do this? We know that the senses are very powerful. All the time we experience our eyes pulling us out, we see something interesting, we smell something nice, we are drawn to it, we hear things, music or people talking, we are drawn by these things. <clears throat> so how can we train our senses? Basically, this verse is talking about Pratyahara. For those of you who are slightly familiar with the Yoga Sutras, this is the fifth step or fifth limb, which would be the more appropriate word. The fifth limb is Pratyahara. If you look for information on Pratyahara, you will not find much. There's very little. And why? It seems to be almost like there's a lot of information, a lot of text, knowledge, textual knowledge available about the yamas and the niyamas, about asan, pranayam, and then almost nothing. Because we come to a realm which becomes more difficult to describe. These Indriyas, they are not well trained generally. And every time we follow the Indriyas, we in fact strengthen their habits. When we observe these habit patterns and observe its connection with manas and use internal dialogue to train our senses, then we can convince the senses to gradually withdraw. Here we are not talking merely about a withdrawal of senses when you sit down to meditate, you close your eyes, you put something in your ears, you make your room dark. That's not what is meant. It means that your senses are not continuously going outward. Can I ask a question about this? Of course. Um, just in terms of understanding the, the text, the, the book, the kind of the intents and purposes of the way the text was constructed, um, why, why do you think there is no mention of any methodology uh, in the text? I mean, why didn't the author say something to the effect of, um, well, you know, he who withdrawals, you know, uses mantra or, you know, something like that to withdraw their senses to become one-pointed or something. So just in terms of trying to understand the, the, the document itself a little better. Yes. Good question, Scott. You see, the Indian traditions, all of them go back to millennia, about five to six thousand years back. And this text itself is a summary of the Upanishads. A lot of people say that the Upanishads or the Vedas have no Tantra in it. And they see rituals. Yes, true, there's rituals, but there is the knowledge of the Upanishads. And one asks, why is it that the Upanishads 
and Bhagavad Gita as well talk more, they describe these things, they describe the processes, they describe the states, but they don't really go much into detail into the practices. And that is because these were always part of a lineage. These texts themselves were not available to everybody. It is only since the last hundred odd years, I would say 100 or 150 years, that the texts have become easily available. And especially in the last uh, five or ten years with uh, everything being out on the internet now, that it's available freely to everybody. But the teachings are in, in a sense not in the words. You can read all these words, you know, black on white. And still, you will not get the essence out of it if you do not practice. And if you're not a part of a lineage where these interpretations are taught to you together with the practice and how you integrate them into your life. And that is because many of these teachings are misunderstood, are abused, literally, you know, uh, misused. So it was done in order to protect. There used to be, and there probably still is, in India, there are still um, traditions and texts which are not available <laughs> in the internet. It might be coming as a surprise, but they still are. Where you will find some person... And it is uh, a text, you know, on loose sheets of paper, bundled up in a, a rag of sorts and carried around. And it will not be given to anybody other than the students of that lineage. One writes on top there, you know, it is not allowed to, to read this book. So there were earlier... Uh, monasteries where it was these texts were kept but nobody was allowed to read them there used to be for example in Madhya Pradesh there were many central India many such places you know uh, tantric temples which below have a lot of caves below the temple in the sort of uh, underground network of little rooms where the yogis would sit and meditate. And that part always remained secret. That is known as Prayog Shastra, the practical part. And it is only taught to those who are then prepared or that are willing to learn, have the right attitude, humility, respect, all these qualities. And then this is explained. So, so you could say maybe in a way this, it's meant to kind of create a, a general culture um, that, that like a, a general public can, can be impressed by or nurtured by, but at the same time offer protection you know, for and create an appetite in, in ones that will that are interested in, in seeking, um, so that, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of general wisdom, but it creates an appetite for the seeker. Yes, yes, something like that. It is, uh, it's not just in the Indian traditions, it is, uh, I believe, also, um, I would say, in uh, Christian traditions, where you would have, perhaps, a kind of a general guidelines for people, who were told earlier, you know, don't do this, don't do that, you know, go to church on, on Sunday and uh, pray and, you know, these kind of guidelines that were meant for the general public. But there were certain teachings like, uh, you know, those that were available only to monks or priests, which I believe is there to this day, partly, um, that there's stuff which is not always discussed um, in all traditions with everybody. 
And Swami Rama, for example, has mentioned this. Uh, he says that the uh, Book of Revelations, these teachings were not understood by people because these were the secret teachings and the language used is, you know, metaphorical, these parables that um, Jesus talks about. These are not really parables. You don't understand that. That's why you call it a parable. But these were then explained uh, to those who were close. And that's where the word Upanishad comes from, sitting close, you know, sitting close near your teacher. And those who were close to the teacher, metaphorically speaking as well, um, were um, the, this wisdom was gradually revealed to them and um, as they evolved, as they grew which is why um, these teachings um, if they would even be given to others they would not understand them, they would misinterpret them and um, it would mislead them. So it is better to keep them um, hidden until the seeker is ready. So the idea of Pratyahara is learning to train the senses and this verse talks about this in a symbolic form of a tortoise withdrawing his limbs. And for our perspective, I would say it's a good idea to observe the indriyas. In yoga, we say there are 10 indriyas. In normal modern science, we talk about five senses, the five cognitive senses. In yoga science, we have five cognitive senses. These are the same as the five cognitive senses in modern science. Uh, eyesight, hearing, smelling, tasting and touch. And we also have five active senses. And we learn to observe these and coordinate these. And when we are able to do this, study this and work with these, we develop this limb of Pratyahara. We learn to withdraw our senses from the objects, the worldly objects. Some of you may have habits like eating sweets or chocolates or, um, you know, may enjoy having tea or coffee. And you may notice sometimes that it's not even really a desire that you want. You don't even really feel like having chocolate or you don't even really feel like having tea or coffee. But when it is, I don't know, for example, four o'clock, you know, you just suddenly find yourself getting up, making yourself a cup of tea or coffee or going and getting yourself some nice little cookies or, you know, whatever. Where does that come from? It comes from the senses. These are habits. So the habit has been formed. If you observe the habit, you begin to see, hmm, actually I didn't even really want to have tea, but I'm just going and doing this very mechanically. And then you observe that, you can say, okay, if I don't really feel like having it, then I don't need to. And the moment you do that, in a sense, you are gaining mastery over these indriyas. So that is the process of how you can withdraw the limbs like a tortoise, withdraw the senses like a tortoise withdraws his limbs. Okay. Anybody likes uh, to comment on that or... Have any questions on this? Okay. 
So verses 59 to 61. When this body bearer desists from food, the senses and the attractions turn away, all except for taste. The taste also ceases upon seeing the Supreme One. Even though an intelligent man continues to endeavor, yet the turbulent senses forcibly draw his mind away. Therefore, controlling them all, joined in yoga, one should remain intent upon me. He whose senses are under control, his wisdom is established. I would like to um, draw your attention here to uh, the word food. This is not actually a very good translation because what is meant by food is the worldly objects. Where, for example, that in the Koshas, the first kosha is the Annamaya kosha. Anna is food. So the world is normally referred to as food. Everything is food. In English, there's a nice little phrase which says food for thought. You know? And what does it mean? What is food for thought? The word. It is, this is all the stimulus that we have around. So all the stimuli, all these are food for the senses. So is this related to Maya then? M maya? Everything is Maya. The world around us is Maya. Yes. So when we ref it, it refers to worldly objects as food and the senses therefore are feasting on this food. When it refers to taste now, again, this is not a good translation because it really makes you think here that you're talking about food and the indriya of taste. The Sanskrit word used here is rasa, which means to be taste, but it also means juice. What does it mean when you have that the desire for something, you know, you have the taste of it, you know, you, you got the taste of it and then you want more. It's another word for desire. Rasa is another word for desire. So, when your senses are not drawn by these worldly objects anymore, but the taste of it remains, the desire remains for most of us. So in the example that I gave you, where you may have mechanically this habit of going and getting yourself tea or coffee or some cookies at four o'clock, because that's what you do. That comes from the senses, even though you may not really have a desire for it. Assuming now that the senses are trained and they're not going and doing these things out of habit, still the desire may remain. So is this kind of like when you salivate even though there's no food, you don't actually not see any food, but your body's just telling you, I want to eat, and um, so you start like salivating? Not, no, that's not quite what it is meant. Hmm. I'm trying to think of a better example, but the only thing which really comes to my mind is or maybe when you watch television at, you know, the same time. If you, you form a habit of maybe watching some kind of news or, or whatever at 8 o'clock in the evening. And you don't even think anymore. You know, you just very unconsciously at, at that time just walk <laughs> down to, to, to your television and, you know, switch it on. Even though you don't really even want to. 
perhaps you would rather be somewhere else. Maybe you would rather be with friends or family. But the habit is very strong. There may be a situation where you have the desire as well as the habit. So you may take somebody who really likes to have sweets and chocolates. There is a desire as well as the habit, right? So now let's assume that you're able to train your senses a little bit. You get more awareness of the senses. But the desire still remains. In a sense, such a person would be, uh, uh, you know, it's almost hypocritical because, you know, you have the desire to eat something, but you just say no to it. We, we know that phenomenon. But now what happens if even that desire disappears? And that's what we are talking about here, that even the desire disappears. So more on a subconscious level? Yes, this is at the unconscious level, that the desire itself is gone. So it's not just about training the conscious mind, but it's actually the desire, the impression, the klesha itself has vanished, has disappeared. So it's like on a deeper koshic level? Okay. Well, there's something, something wrong with um, the sound today. Uh, yeah, kind of, but let, let's keep it simple. Let's, let's not make it too complicated. Let's keep it simple and say there's a level at the conscious level you can train the mind, but there's something at the unconscious level. And when you have seen the Supreme One, which is pure consciousness, when you see the Supreme One, then this desire itself goes away. It seems to just, it vanishes over time until you're finally established in it. So it explains that an intelligent person would then continue to endeavor. He has seen it once, he has seen the Supreme Self, and he continues to endeavor. These turbulent senses keep forcing the mind away, but then if he keeps his mind joined in yoga, he experiences the Supreme One, pure consciousness, and finally is established in it. So this is explaining the process of how one becomes the witness. By withdrawing our identification with the worldly objects, Still, so finally, even the unconscious desire for these disappears and we remain established in pure consciousness. So we don't have to understand everything, so we can let that sit. Yes, Gautam, you wanted to ask something? Yeah, uh, Radhika ji. Uh... So is it wrong to have desires or uh, is it it's okay for desires to come up when one is completely aware of the desires? What do you think? Is it wrong to have desires, Gautam? What, did I, you, what do you have? Personally, I, uh, no, personally, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I think uh, my understanding is if there are desires coming up, but I'm aware that this is a desire and I'm, I'm experiencing it, but at the same time, not trying to get attached to it. Yes. Yes, that's good. We need to observe the desires and those, especially those desires that may be useful and in a way helpful to us. We can strengthen them. There is no harm then in satisfying those desires. For example, if you have a desire to, uh, to lead a healthy life, to be happy, to be enlightened, yeah? these are uh, desires that would be worth strengthening. You know, it's good to strengthen this longing. And there are other desires that we can slowly let go of with awareness. 
So if we remain aware and conscious of what is coming up, then we can work very differently with our desires. Purely suppressing desires is extremely harmful. It's not a very therapeutic way of dealing with desires. So we need to learn to do what I sometimes call desire management. We need to have a look at what it is that we want and whether it is a good idea to satisfy the desire. We can fall into a trap of fueling a desire further. So we have to watch out for that, that if we do it with awareness, that we do not fuel that desire further, that we do not strengthen it further, that it is the desire is fulfilled and then it is done. And that... Yeah, but uh, do I... Uh, sorry, uh, do I need to label a desire whether it's a good desire or a bad desire as long as I'm aware of it? Uh, because you said strengthening certain desires which are good, but then that becomes very subjective, which is also dependent on, on my desire. <laughs> yeah, you see, we need to analyze us, our minds and our life a little bit. Maybe not initially. If you are meditating and you are going through a certain process, then initially one focuses on mastering the process. But for those of you, for example, who are in the mentoring program, you do this. Having achieved a certain level of expertise in the process itself, we slowly start going into the content of the conscious and unconscious mind and then we start this process that we call contemplation with analysis everything that's in the mind all our pleasures are black white or mixed and we need to see which are useful to us for our development and which are not useful. So if I have a, a, a habit pattern which is very negative, harmful, for example, anger, pride, you know, these are definitely not going to help me to evolve further. So I would need to learn to let go of this. That is what we call Renunciation. Renunciation is not about giving up the world and escaping from the reality. It is quite the opposite. It's facing oneself and seeing, okay, there are your traits in me that I can let go of. And that's why that process, at some point of time, we have to come to it. If we want to evolve for speedy progress. If you are not in a hurry, then it's totally fine. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, verses 59 to 61 describe the process of how one becomes a witness. Verses 62 and 63. As a person contemplates the objects of the senses, there arises in him attachment to them. From attachment arises desire. From desire, anger is produced. From anger comes delusion. From delusion, the confusion of memory and loss of mindfulness. From the disappearance of memory and mindfulness, the loss of the faculty of discrimination. By loss of the faculty of discrimination, one perishes. So now, the opposite process is described. 
Here it explains what happens if you do not learn to attain mastery. You will end up getting attached to all these objects rather than letting go of them and gaining mastery and control. No, control is the wrong word, sorry. Learning to convince your senses. You get attached to them. You, you follow these wildly all over the place. And the habits of the senses get stronger. Greater attachment is strengthening the desire. Which is why I said earlier, when you satisfy a desire, you have to watch out that you don't fuel the desire. You don't strengthen the desire. Because if you do, the desire gets stronger and from desire, anger is produced. Why anger? Because you cannot fulfill all desires. When you do not get what you want, you get angry. So from desire, anger is produced. From anger comes delusion or confusion. You know, when you, you may have experienced, as all of us have surely experienced this sometimes in your situation where you were so angry that you could not think properly. You did not know what to say. And even if you tried to speak, you know, the words didn't come out right. You started talking nonsense, you know, you made a complete fool of yourself because you were so angry you, didn't, you could not express yourself. What happened there? This was exactly what happened, the process. You got attached to something, you, your desire strengthened because you did not get it, you got extremely angry and because you were very angry, your mental faculties didn't work together in a coordinated manner. There was confusion. And the confusion finally leads to a loss of memory. You just imagine it's totally natural. If you are confused or if... Take a situation where everybody's running helter-skelter. You know, there's a lot of confusion happening. How can you remember things, you know? There's total chaos. Nobody knows what the other person is doing. Similarly, if the mind is confused... All the different aspects of the mind, the antakarna, manas, buddhi, chitta, and ankara, they're all going in different directions. There's no awareness. And if there's no awareness, that means a loss of memory. Because memory is simply another term for paying attention. So you have loss of mindfulness or loss of attention. You're not able to pay attention, you're not aware. And from the loss of memory and awareness comes the loss of buddhi. That means your buddhi is not sharp. So attachment ultimately leads to a dull buddhi. And if you have a dull buddhi, you are you have no, no chance. There's no hope for you. For progress, you need to have a sharp buddhi. So this is the opposite process from becoming a witness. This, you can say, is the downfall. Doesn't sound very nice thing, right? Sounds terrible, in fact. Delusion, confusion, loss of memory, loss of mindfulness. Sounds terrible. And when your buddhi is not sharp, there's tremendous suffering and pain. So... Anybody likes to comment on this or say something or any question? So we can continue the next ones. Hello? Hello, Yes, Samya. So I had a question. Uh, uh, if someone should not contemplate on worldly object, mm. what are the things he could call, contemplate on? 
So, Amir, that's um, a difficult question to answer because this is something we first need to figure out for ourselves what it is that we want. So, you have to say, okay, um, do a little contemplation first yourself on what it is that you want out of your life. And if you say, yes, I, I want to be a happier person, more balanced person, it doesn't always have to be some grand thing like I want to be enlightened or moksha. If you even just say, I want to be a happy person, I want to be a balanced person, then one lives one's life accordingly. You need to organize your life. And one way that one can contemplate on positive things is, of course, you can read scriptural texts, you can read ins inspiring, you know, stories and uh, books. Yet, I have always said that there are limitations to these and it is best to have a guide or a teacher. And only a guide or a teacher who knows you can then prescribe the right object of contemplation for you. Generally, in our tradition, we prepare the student from the beginning, which means beginning with food and lifestyle, preparing the person for meditation involves learning to uh, be physically healthy, learning to sit, how to sit. You know, all this, it is, it is a science. Therefore, your question is uh, quite, <laughs> quite difficult to answer because it's an entire process one goes through. So at one level, I can simply say, if you don't have a teacher, you can do some self-study, also read um, scriptures, some inspirational things. And if you have a teacher, then you work with the teacher. And if you don't have a teacher and you want to have, have some guidance, prayer, for example, is another very good thing that uh, people can do. For that, you don't need any tradition or any teacher. Everyone can pray. And prayer is a dialogue with the divine. You say what is in your heart, in your own words, and strengthen that longing in you. Right? Then you should continue, continue with that and if you have a teacher then you should continue to keep in contact and, uh, and okay. All right. so, uh, yes. I had a small comment, I mean because the word used was contemplation and contemplation I guess suggests a little bit of detachment from what you're looking at. So maybe that's a bit confusing. I don't know what the original word in Sanskrit is. My Sanskrit is not that good. You, but, you mean in the earlier words? I guess is a bit misleading. That's a word. It's dhyan. It's dhyan. Yeah, dhyan. The word contemplation, you're right, is, is misleading. Um, obviously, that, that's a good point, Ashish. The, Though we are not always contemplating on objects, worldly objects, in the sense that uh, we are sitting down and, and looking in them and contemplating upon them, but we are preoccupied with worldly objects, worldly desires. We are thinking about how shall we get a car, how shall we get a house, you know, how shall we uh, get a new job, all these things. And that's what is meant by one who's contemplating on objects of the world. This is a preoccupation. We are always thinking 
in a sense, in a materialistic way. We are always going outwards. I think preoccupation would make the meaning much more clear if that, that was the word used. Yes, yeah. I think preoccupi we are preoccupied with these external things. Yeah. 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 Verses 64 and 65. Conducting oneself to the senses towards the objects of the senses, however free of attraction and aversion and under control of the self, one cultivating the self attains a healthy and pleasant state of mind. Upon attaining such pleasantness of mind, there is a diminution of all sorrows. The intelligence of a person of such a pleased mind attends quickly upon him. These verses have also used uh, words for translations that I am not entirely uh, happy with. Um, for example, uh, it talks about uh, attaining a healthy and pleasant state of mind. Actually, the Sanskrit says prasadam. Prasad is, you know, uh, that grace or what comes from God gift so prasadam in yogic terms is attaining a, uh, the state of union cultivating the self attains a state of union is a state of joy or grace and one can very superficial way translate this to healthy and pleasant mind but I think that gives the wrong impression and attaining therefore attaining that prasadam that grace all sorrows are reduced or, or banished and the intelligence of such a person attends quickly upon him that means buddhi is very sharp so here what we are saying is, in these two verses, again it goes back to the nature of a witness, is that you may use the objects of the world, but without attachment and without aversion. So it's not that you have to renounce those objects. It's not thyaga, it's vairagya. These two Verses are now referring to Vairagya. It says, enjoy these objects. Enjoy all objects of the world, but don't get attached to them. They do not belong to you. You don't need to be averse to anything either. Because there are a lot of people in yoga, they have this idea, we should not do this, we should not do that, that is bad, you know. When Gautam asked the question about desires, I asked him, what do you think? A lot of people think we should not have desires. Desires are bad. So, here we say, you can enjoy the things of the world without attachment or aversion. Raga Dvesha. Without attachment or without aversion. But none of them belong to you. When you do that, you are established in the self. You attain grace. So with such grace, all sorrows disappear. The buddhi gets extremely sharp. So it goes further into describing this state of a witness. The quality of this witness is a very, is very sharp word thing. Sorrow, is this word sorrow like, uh, related to like Krishna and Krishna? Which word? The, the word sorrows. Like I was thinking of the Yoga Sutras. Um, I, I'm, I'm not yeah. getting the word you're referring to. Self? Self? Uh, you know, Krishna. No, but you said, is this the word self? Is the, You're talking about the self here, this word? No, the word sorrows. Sorrows, oh, sorrows. Uh, yes, uh, those are the, um, the impressions which are uh, creating pain. Yes, 
You see, they create pain or pain or pleasure. It doesn't matter. It is part of the dualities. And the moment you are in duality, there is pain and suffering. We see pleasure as something good or, you know, it's pleasurable. But in fact, even pleasure leads ultimately to suffering. Does that make sense? So it doesn't matter whether it is pleasurable or not. All of these finally lead to suffering. Therefore, if you enjoy the objects without attachment or aversion, you are a witness. And when you're established in that, you attain this state of what he calls a pleasant healthy mind here or pleasant uh, person is, is prasadam, it's grace. So this is a witness. Uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, if it's not too distracting, um, is there, would you suggest any other translation as being particularly great? Hmm. You know the thing is, Scott, with these translations, the difficulty has always been that the original language is um, in Sanskrit, some of the words are technical, and finding the appropriate English translation is very difficult. And when you try then to translate it, um, you maybe end up using a whole sentence instead of one word. And uh, so I have personally not found um, really any translation that I say is 100% great. Um, there are people who are studying the verses and the English and, you know, breaking it down into each Sanskrit word with multiple translations of the word. And I, I don't know. Um, whether that is helpful, I cannot recommend uh, any other translation either at this point of time. If I can just... Okay, not... Yeah. Um, you might, might just want to wait until I finish mine. <laughs> Do that. <laughs> I am actually working on it currently, so we expect it to be done by by next year, mid-2017. Released as an e-book? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, thanks. I'll look forward to that. Okay. okay. So, yes, so that was the, the state of Vairagya explained. And um, we have the next verses. I mean, we have a couple of minutes to go. And uh, these are also a very interesting group of verses. I like the way they have been grouped together uh, because they, they form these little groups and explaining certain little processes which are very important. And once again here, this group uh, of verses 66 to 68 is describing a scattered mind. So like we had earlier, the whole process of the downfall, now this is explaining the scattered mind a little bit more in detail. There is no discriminating wisdom in one who is not joined in yoga, nor is there any cultivating of contemplativeness for one who is not joined in yoga. One who has not cultivated contemplation has no peace. How can there be happiness for one who is not at peace? The mind that is applied to following the senses, the wandering senses. Indeed, such a mind plunders his wisdom as wind blows a boat in the water. How, therefore, O mighty armed one, he who senses one and all are held in control and held back from their objects 
his wisdom is established. Very nice, uh, he explained in verse 66, the entire process. If there is no discriminative wisdom, that is, no buddhi, if there's no buddhi, you cannot have a one-pointed mind. So it says, you know, you're not joined in yoga, you're not, the antakarna is not joined together, it's not one-pointed. If you're not one-pointed, there is no contemplativeness here. The word in Sanskrit used is bhavana, from bhava, that, that bhava is the devotion, that, that longing, the, the, the rasa, you know, the juice the amrit, the nectar that flows when you are one-pointed. So if you have no buddhi, then you cannot be one-pointed. If you are not one-pointed, there is no bhava. If there is no bhava on this divine, this divine feeling, then there will be no peace. And if there is no peace, how can you be happy? So it goes through that entire process. And says, if you follow the warning is, if you follow the wandering senses, then you're just plundering your wisdom. It's throwing it away, it's just as the wind blows a boat in water, it's just being blown around, you know. Therefore, gain mastery over the senses. Once again, I'm not so happy about the word control here. When we use words like control, we tend to get a little bit, you know, rigid. And I personally really like the example of a team. We are all in a team. And for those of us who are following, um, you know, team games, whether it is cricket or soccer or whatever it may be, you know the importance of a team. And so... I see this more as coordination and working together, accepting the things as they are and not imposing things on yourself. That kind of control leads only to suppression which at some point of time backfires on you. So it's a process which comes through, simply begins with Paying attention, becoming more aware, more conscious, following the systematic method, sharpening your buddhi, attaining a one-pointed mind, which would lead to prasadam, grace, and to resolution of all conflicts and peace, finally to happiness. These were the different processes which were described in um, these groups of verses here today. Some very nice uh, and interesting processes uh, which lead upwards to evolution or downwards to the lower states of consciousness. So in a sense... One tells you the path where you can progress and the other is a warning of what will happen if you follow the wandering senses, the wayward wild senses. We have the beautiful image in the Bhagavad Gita of the chariot being led by horses. And we know that if these horses are not well trained, they are wild they would just go haywire. What would happen to the chariot? The chariot would just collapse. Right? And the chariot is your body. So, untrained senses would lead to your ruin. You would perish ultimately, as it says. So, we can stop here today. In some very intense... Um, verses. I hope that you can con contemplate on some of these. 
till next week, till next Friday, because they are very, very intense. And um, we will catch up on Sunday for those who are joining. And so we see you next Friday. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Radhika. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Radhika. Bye. Bye, Nita.